Well, it's no surprise to you that American Idol is one of the most popular shows on TV right now. In fact, some of you are thinking about it right now. <laughs> uh, you're missing it right now. And if you weren't already thinking about it, now you are. And you're suddenly thinking of who your favorite people are and all that sort of thing. You can just do what I do. This is what I do. I'm sort of limited on time sometimes. So I just, I just hit the highlights later online. And, and most of you know, even if you haven't really gotten plugged into that show, you know that what it is, you have some singers come out and sing, and then they face the critique. They face the panel to either hear yes or no. And they hear a lot more than that. And there are three judges that have been on that show. You have Paula Abdul, you have Randy Jackson, and of course the most well-known probably is Simon. <laughs> there you see Simon on the uh, screen up there. But you know Paula, her personality, she at least tries to be nice if you've watched the show. She'll, she'll tell someone no, but she beats around the bush a lot. She says things like, I just love your hair, you know, or those <laughs> shoes just go so well with that outfit. And eventually they have to say, Paula, is it a yes or no? Well, well kind of no, you know, but, but, but I do like those shoes, you know. And then Randy, he has two words that he loves. He loves the words pitchy. He says, pitchy and dog. Everything's dog. Whether it's good or bad, you're a dog. Good, bad, good dog, bad dog, but pitchy. He say, dog, that was pitchy. I just didn't like it. Out of pitch or whatever. And, but it's the critic that shoots so straight that so many people love to hate, and that is Simon. He always goes last, and people are always waiting to see what he has to say. And if you have never really heard or seen Simon, well, tonight is your chance to do so, we're going to run just a very short video, and you'll see why so many people tune in just to hear what he has to say. Oh, Robert, I think you just killed my favorite song of all time. Killed in a good way or a bad way? I'm afraid. Well, listen, <laughs> killing is never good. Killing is never good. <laughs> it's never a happy killing. I'm uh, sorry to hear that. No, I mean, that was first degree on that one. Oh, Scott, it was dreadful. <laughs> no, no, really dreadful. Um, and I'm saying that to be kind because. You will never, ever, ever have a career in singing. I don't believe you. I'm telling you. I don't believe you. I'm telling you. Well, you can tell me all you want, but I won't believe you. Remember these words, you're not a singer. Not in a billion years. There are only so many words I can drag out of my vocabulary to say how awful that was. You actually sing like a, like a train going off the rails. You sort of start off in tune, yeah. and then it just goes completely yeah, it started off. started off nice. Yeah. And very, very fast. You don't necessarily have to have a great voice to be a pop singer. Don't believe a word of it. You taking singing lessons? Yes, I do. Who's your teacher? There was this lady up in Montana. Do you have a lawyer? No, I don't have a lawyer. Get a lawyer and sue her. Seriously. I'm serious. I say no for Hollywood. You're not ready yet. Paula? Unfortunately, you're not ready yet. Unfortunately, you'll never be ready. Terrible. Excuse me. <laughs> you must be joking, sorry. Yeah, I'm lying, you were brilliant, it was terrible. It was a bit like watching a ship sink, that audition. It just started off there and you just sunk. Did you say like the Titanic? Alright guys. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. No, neither was I. <laughs> this was a complete breath of fresh air. I thought you were absolutely fantastic. Now, as you can see from that little clip there, um, Simon, well, he earns his money by basically insulting people. For uh, 20 million a year is what he's making uh, for coming up with new ways to say, hey, save your voice. You know, save your voice for, for the shower, uh, save our ears the pain. And he is really known for those negative, nasty comments that he makes. And, and yet, here's the thing, he actually will give some very rave reviews, as you heard there at the end. When he says, listen, that was fantastic, he means it. And you'll see that when he is saying that, it really is an incredible thing. This was uh, Paul Potts. I don't have time to show the whole thing for you, but if you have a Google search, go look for Paul Potts. It was actually the British version of the show. Funny that we're talking so much about British things tonight, but you'll be very inspired by his story. And you'll see that, that, of course, Simon can be blunt. He can be harsh. He can be brutally honest. And by his own admission, he says, hey, I'm arrogant, I'm self-absorbed, I'm proud, and I'm proud of it. And so, you know, he's not really the greatest example, maybe, in the world. 
And even his fans sometimes think he has gone too far. And there have been some times where he's made some very personal comments that he kind of got in some trouble for. But all of us know deep down that, you know what, sometimes the truth hurts and sometimes the truth has to be told. And so often we'll, you know, just have, tune in and listen to him and we'll see that Simon says what we were thinking but would never actually say. And so there are those critics in every life. Every life has critics in it. Every area of life has them. You have music critics, you have movie critics, you have art critics and food critics and fashion critics and all the rest of that. Political critics, we're getting to hear a lot of that. And even puppets have critics. I don't know if you remember, but all the Muppet movies, they had those two old guys that sit up there and just cut all the cracks, you know. And sometimes you feel like that's your life, you know, that there's always somebody out there criticizing it and having something to say sarcastic about it. And the thing is, critics are often right. That's hard. Maybe, maybe they say something and they say it in a tough way, but they're right. But this is the thing. Critics can also just plain be wrong. And that's why Christians need to be critical, critical thinkers, even when it comes to critics. Now, I titled tonight's teaching, 2 Corinthians 10, Critical Thinking, because of that reason. And it's not because I want us to be critical Christians. You know, the kind who would go around criticizing people and finding fault with everything. No, it's the other real meaning of that word, which is to think through carefully and clearly and knowing what critics in our lives to listen to and which ones to ignore. That's very, very important. And before we get into tonight's passage, I at least want to make those two main categories very clear in our minds that we've already heard probably, which is constructive criticism and destructive criticism. Constructive criticism is that which is seeking to build you up. And the Bible talks about someone speaking the truth in love. That's Ephesians 4 verse 15. And that's a great little biblical balance right there, speaking the truth in love. But then you have destructive criticism. What's that? Well, that's loveless lies or even loveless truth of some type where somebody is just trying to tear a person down. And you know already if you've ever been criticized and who hasn't that even constructive criticism is hard to hear. I mean, nobody goes, man, I really, really enjoy being corrected. I just think it's so wonderful. And yet the Bible has a lot of correction and direction for our lives. And so that's one of the reasons a lot of people stay away from the Bible. The Proverbs all throughout say it in many different ways. Hey, a fool despises correction. And so, you know, it's important, you know, some people would say, well, I don't even want to hear that. You know, don't instruct me that way. But the Bible says it, that it's foolish to not want to hear at least constructive criticism in our life. But destructive criticism is something else entirely, and it's something that we ought to reject. And in fact, we may even have a responsibility to rebuke it when it comes into our lives. And how do you know the difference in your life between constructive criticism and destructive criticism? Well, I'm going to give you a few definitions, and we're going to look tonight at this chapter, which has so much to do with this topic. And I know there's a lot of people in life who reject even the constructive criticism in their life, but there's others who accept, unfortunately, destructive criticism in their life. So they're listening to the wrong voices and rejecting the wrong voices. But constructive criticism, this is what it is. It's what God would have to say about your life in the way that God would say it. That's constructive criticism. If God were to look at your life and give an honest assessment the way he would say it and what he would say. Now, destructive criticism is what Satan would say if he were to look at your life and the way that he would say it. And we need to know the difference between constructive and destructive criticism and what to do with each of them. And so that's the critical thinking that we will be doing together tonight. Now, Paul was a critic. It's important for you to know this. But he was a constructive critic. He was first a critic of his own life. He said that he judged his own life, as we all should, so that we would not have to come under a different judgment. He said, if you'll first just look at your life honestly and you'll address the issues, well, then you won't have to have other people address them for you. And so Paul was a critic of himself in the right way. You see, he was critical of others in some times where he would constructively say to them some instruction, some direction, as we've seen with the book of Corinthians. And he even sometimes would be constructively critical of his enemies. He was never a destructive critic. And it's a good idea in your life to have at least a few friends who love you enough to do 
what the Bible says, which is to speak the truth in love. Somebody who would come to you and say, hey, this is maybe not what you want to hear, but this is what you need to hear. Now, not somebody who's doing that every day. You know, every day I'm here to be your personal assistant, and I'm going to make sure that you know all of your flaws. No, but somebody who, when you're off the track, out of tune in life, that they'd be able to say, hey, I've noticed things are getting a little bit that way. And the Bible says better are the wounds of a friend than the kisses of an enemy. That's Proverbs 27, 6. And that's what it's talking about there. So Paul was a critical thinker. He was a constructive critic. But Paul also had critics. And most of his critics were destructive critics. And the final four chapters that we're going to have here in 2 Corinthians, if you look at it uh, over the next few weeks that we'll be studying, it, it's chapters 10 through 13. And Paul in that gets very, very bold, kind of uncharacteristically so. I mean, he gets really out front, and even several times he, he had introduces it with kind of an apology. He says, listen, this is going to be hard to take, but here's the way I'm going to have to say it. And he is really criticizing his critics. That's what's happening. And it's not because he couldn't take criticism, because he was getting all defensive and all that sort of thing, like some often do. No, he was a, a man, again, very quick to judge his own shortcomings, his own sins. He was very open about those things. And he was very slow, actually, to criticize others. It was not his first resort, but it was a last resort that he would go to. And this is the thing. Paul could not stay silent about something that was going on in the Corinthian church. And it was destructive criticism about Christianity. That's really what it was. Within the church, there were those who were critical of Christ. And they were doing it by way of being critical of Paul. But really, Paul was God's servant, God's messenger, bringing God's message. And so as they tore him down, they were really tearing down the gospel that he was bringing, the truth that he was giving. Again, Paul let himself go through many indignities, but the one thing that he would not allow is somebody to criticize Christ. Destructive criticism of that sort, no, he step, stepped in and said something about it because he knew that it was corrupting the Christians. He knew that it was even affecting the unbelievers in the town, and they were messing with God's sheep. And so Paul faced this destructive criticism, these critics here with a real holy boldness. And he called the Christians there, and he's calling us through the scriptures to critical thinking. And if you've ever wondered what that balance there is between speaking the truth in love, if you've ever wondered what that is, how do I do that? Well, Paul puts himself on display and lets himself be seen and observed doing that very thing. And again, if you want to know what speaking the truth is, well, maybe you could see what Simon says. But if you want to know what speaking the truth in love is, well, you'll have to go to the Bible. And so 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1, let's go ahead and read it together. We'll read the first six verses and then come back and comment on them. It says, Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beg you, that when I am present, I may not be bold with the confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, meaning we're human beings, he says, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity and the obedience of Christ. And he says in verse 6, hey, we're ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now again, I think every critic, whatever they might be, whatever realm they may be in, has their standard of good and bad, right and wrong, what they like, what they don't. And there are things that every judge looks for, and God is no different. As you see tonight, we're going to see God's standards, and we're just going to see three things that God is looking for, expecting, and applauding in a person's life. And the first one is found there in verses 1 through 6, in the life of Paul, it was in the life of Christ, and it ought to be in the life of Christians, which is meekness, but not weakness. Meekness, but not weakness. Now, Paul makes it very clear. First of all, he says we are in a war, a spiritual battle. And a lot of people don't even recognize or accept that statement. But 
it's very clear that if you're in a war, there's really no place for weakness in war. War is not for the weak, as you're a soldier in that. Meekness, very, very important for a soldier. Weakness, it can't be a part of the package. So meekness and weakness, two very, very different things. What does meek mean? Well, the, the best definition really is patient power. Patient power, someone who has power under control, strength under discipline, that is what meekness is. And the Greeks used the word in the way that uh, a warrior might by saying a horse, like let's say you had a horse and you're riding into horse on, in battle, you don't want a weak horse. You want a meek horse. You want a horse that is strong, but under your command, under your direction. And some people think of being a Christian as being weak. You know that it takes a weakness to be a Christian. Well, I don't believe that that is what God has called us to at all. We're not supposed to just always be nice. You know, be nice. That's one of the things as parents, sometimes we say to our kids, be nice, just be nice, be nice. You know what? I don't know that nice is exactly what I want my kids to be. I want them to be meek. That's really a better description of what I would like my kids to be. Not nice necessarily, not always sweet and positive and affirming and everything is okay and all that kind of stuff. See, a lot of people, if they were to go and sing their favorite song of life, of what they think Christianity is about, and I'm not going to sing it because Simon would ding me, but it would be home, home on the range, where the deer and the antelope play, where never is heard a discouraging word and the clouds the skies are not cloudy all day they think that's what christianity is supposed to be about that we're just always looking on the bright side of life but i really think that's a false view of christ and christianity he wasn't just a happy hippie you know not just a peace love not war kind of guy and so many people will kind of take a verse out of context and say you can't judge me doesn't the bible say never judge don't judge anything and that sort of thing wouldn't, uh, you know, would Jesus judge? He, he, he would not say anything critical or corrective of anybody. But, you know, the whole thing about that, if you rebuke a person like that, they'll say, where's the love? You know, where's the love? I thought you guys were supposed to be about love and all that. But look at Christ. He was the one who was loving. And what was his life all about? Well, he was meek, but not weak. Jesus was gentle and patient and all of that. But he was very bold when the time called for it. When it came a reason to be bold, he was. You see in John 2, just one of two times that he cleansed the temple, that he went in with a whip and he drove out the deceivers and he turned over tables and he said, look, you're out of here and don't come back. And when they did come back, he came back and dealt with it again. And you see in Matthew 23, when there is... A, a, an interaction toward the end of his ministry he had many other interactions first but by the end he gets to the hypocrites and he says you know what woe to you guys you are snakes you're whitewashed tombs and he says you're on your way to hell and you're dragging as many people with you as you can now you say whoa that's not the flannel graph Jesus I saw when I was growing up but it's the Jesus of Scripture that's the biblical balance again not his first resort but certainly one of the things that is a part of his character. And you're never going to see Jesus say that kind of harsh words, those kind of strong statements to a humble sinner. Never did somebody come and say, please have mercy on me. And he said, you whitewashed tomb, get out of here. Or something like that. Never, ever, ever did Jesus do that. When did Jesus get bold? When did he get bold? When did he get in people's face? Well, it wasn't when he was being hurt. See, when, even when he was being crucified, it says he opened not his mouth. He did not revile. He did not return hurt for that. When did he get bold? He got bold when other people were getting hurt. That's when he got really, really upset. Again, a very good sign of an other-centered person is not that they get so riled up when they are being offended, but when others are being offended, when others are being led astray, when others are being hurt. And that's exactly what was happening in Corinth, and that's when Paul got bold. And that's when we have the same responsibility. When God's reputation is at stake, and when it is being ruined, when hypocrites and wolves and all the rest of that are keeping people away from God's truth with their lies and their lives, well, that is a time to be bold. And in the same way, that's what you see in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It's Paul just saying, look, I'm just following in the footsteps of my master. I'll be meek, but I'm not going to be weak. And so Paul pleaded with them. That was a, 
a meek thing to do, to plead and be patient. He was gentle. But there came a point, there came a time, there came a corner that he said, you know what, it's time for boldness. It's time for the false teachers and the hypocrites and the manipulators to hear the truth and it's going to hurt them. But it's going to keep others from getting hurt and that's important. And Paul couldn't be there physically all the time, you know. And so he wrote love letters, some bold lo love letters, some very tough truths, and we've studied some of those things. And he promises in those letters, hey, if I still need to deal with this when I get there, I will, but I'd prefer, obviously, to have it already resolved by the time I get there. And so that's really the context of this understanding here. In the first verse of chapter 10, verse 1, you see there, Paul's quoting their critique of him. He's saying, you know, you guys, I know what you say about me. I hear these things. They come back to me. He says, I know you say that I'm a, a big talker when I'm not here, you know, that, that I, I write these, you know, emails and I write these things that are real strong, but as soon as I get there, I chicken out. See, in our old neighborhood, we had a dog that was like that, that was just one of these little dogs that would run at you and bark at you and then it, all you had to do was turn around toward it, take one step toward it, and yee, 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 you know, it was, and I used to think it was kind of a fun game, you know, get it to bark at me and then, you know, take a step and make it run. It's a chicken, you know, it's not a dog, it's a chicken. And that's what they're saying about Paul here. They're saying, you know what, he's just, he's no dog, he's a chicken. And yet they say, he's coming back to him and say, you know what, dog, you want to call me dog? I can tell you this, this dog can bite too. And he uses the words of warfare and he says, I will, as any reasonable person would, exhaust all diplomatic efforts, but I'm not afraid to fight and I will not run from it. And I used to read lots of comic books as a kid. I don't know, I was really a geek, I still am. But, but you know, back then it, there was always the superhero who was like the alter ego, you know, the mild-mannered Clark Kent, who was really Superman, all that kind of stuff. And one of the ones I really liked was Hulk, the Incredible Hulk. Not Hulkamania, which is a totally different thing, although he's got his own appeal, you know, but Bruce Banner, uh, the Incredible Hulk, you know, the, the, the guy who Lou, uh, what's his name, played uh, on that show. But the way he was played in that was that there would be a, a kind of mild-mannered Bruce Banner, you know, and, and, and somebody would start messing around with people, start hurting people or doing something wrong or whatever, and Bruce would kind of make an appeal and say, please, stop that, please. I, I, I don't want to have to hurt you. You know, and they would look at him and they'd go, oh, come on, you're going to hurt me? you got to be kidding, look at you. You know, and he'd go, oh, no, it's going to happen, you know, and then, you know, and out would he ruin another pair of pants, you know. <laughs> Here comes the Hulk. And that's kind of what Paul is saying in a way. He's kind of begging him, look, I don't want to, I don't want to have to be, you know, Paul the Avenger. I don't want to have to be the guy who has to come in and be so tough. I don't want to get bold. Now, again, he's, he's saying here, it's your choice how I'm going to react. And Paul, you know, was he, as he's talking about boldness here, was he talking about putting him kind of in a, a headlock or pulling an atomic knee drop on him or some of those other things, you know? No, he knew the battle was spiritual, and that's what we're looking at tonight. Not physical, but look at verse 4. He says, the weapons of our warfare, not carnal. That's really important to point out. This is a great verse to know. If you want to know how to live a victorious life with all the critics of your life and all the people who would have different opinions on what your life ought to be like and how it should be lived, this is really an important verse. It says they're not carnal. What does carnal mean? Well, as a gringo who knows a little Spanish, carne. It means meat. It's like, is it a person who's just doing it in the flesh, a meathead, you know, seeing things that way. And, and the weapons of his Critics, they were very carnal. What were they? Well, manipulation, rules and regulations. They were legalists. They were coming in and trying to put a trip on people and trying to get them to believe in Jesus plus their little uh, brand of it and all that sort of thing. They were very self-righteous and they thought well, it was we four and no more and they would try to get little clicks inside the church and do all kinds of things like that. And aren't you so glad that that sort of thing doesn't happen today? But it did in Paul's day. And so... What you see there is a lot of unfair critics. Uh, that was what they were doing, constantly criticizing Paul, because Paul preached and lived God's grace in all its glory, the gospel in its pure form, and he would preach that everywhere he went, but as soon as he left, people would dive on the people and try and do different things to him. 
And so he's saying, you know what, this is a warfare, and the weapons of our warfare are so different than that. He says it's the word of God, it's prayer, it's the spirit of God, those things the Bible talks about. Again, the truth and love, it's the truth that will triumph over the false, even when it looks like the false may have the upper hand for a little while. And again, it's Paul not just telling them the truth, but living it in front of them in so many ways. And he says it was mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Now, what are strongholds? People like to talk about this a lot. Well, I think the best way is to go back to the illustration I used a couple of weeks ago. Several of you have asked, how is the bathroom remodel going? If you were here, you know I used that example. Well, I, you will be happy to know I finally took a shower in that shower just today. And so I was getting kind of nasty there for a while. But pulling down of strongholds, one of the things that happened during that is there's the demolition part and there's things that just have to come out. I mean, there are walls that had to be moved. There were cabinets that just had to go. And there were several times where uh, the person I was working with, I'll, I'll let him stay anonymous, but his name's Bill and he's sitting right over there. And he, he was uh, basically, he, he's very persistent with things and I love the way he does it. We went out into the garage and got a crowbar that I had. It's called a gorilla bar. This thing, uh, it, it's mighty for the tearing down of strongholds. Let's just put it this way. And he, we would just go for something and he'd say, well, it, it doesn't want to come out, but we're just going to have to talk with it a little bit longer, you know, and we're going to use the bar to help it uh, see things our way. And I think, really, again, if you were thinking about carnal weapons, you might say, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go crowbar our critics, you know. But that's what God is saying. You actually can do that. You can do that in the spiritual realm with the weapons that God has for us. He has a godly gorilla bar, and it's called prayer, that'll pry things loose that don't look like they're going to come loose where you look and say there's no way that that person who has always been so critical of Christianity always so critical of my life always so destructive in my life could ever 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 turn around and yet God says hey try these weapons and the high places what are they well he's talking here about it and in any war people know there's a saying in war which is the one who controls the high ground wins the war. See, that's why they always try to put people up on things, because if you're sitting up here shooting at somebody who's trying to run up the hill, guess who's going to win? You've got the high place. And so he says, this is what's happening. Satan's always trying to get the upper hand, the upper place in a person's life, in their heart and in their mind. And he says, you know what? God is going to continually be taking those things down and tearing those things down so that he keeps the high ground in your life. And, and the battle is for the hearts and minds of people. If you don't know that already, you haven't been paying attention because it's just so incredible how Satan wants to have the hearts and minds of our kids, of our families, of our friends, of our loved ones. And you see it and you see a stronghold where you say, man, how can this be so strong in their life? Well, again, the weapons of our warfare, God says they're mighty for taking those things down and nothing can get us in the flesh and so much carnal just like it you know fighting flesh with flesh quite like somebody who's unfair in their criticism of us but when we are on that level we are losing see that's what the Bible says that basically you're not gonna win the war that way in thinking that your wife who may be critical of you is the enemy, or that your husband who's critical, or your ex who's critical, or any of the rest of that, your kids, that, that they're the enemy in your life. And he says, no, you're not looking at it right. Ephesians 6.12 tells us how to look at it. It says, we don't wrestle. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And yeah, there's strongholds, but there's a stronger one in us than the one that is in the world. And so if you're a Christian, you will have critics. At least if you're doing it right, you will. And there will be people who criticize and oppose you simply because you remind them of Christ and they criticize and oppose him. And so some may even wrap some spiritual thing about, around their argument or some intellectual thing that looks so high and mighty, but in the end, the one who's on God's side will certainly win, and he will tear those things. They're mighty, they're meek, 
but not weak. And so Paul says in verse 6, as we end that section out, I like it kind of, he says, I'll give you some time, Corinthians, to think that through. You know, chew on that verse, think on that one, decide which side of the war you want to be on. The winning side with the mighty weapons or the one that loses in the end. So that's God's standard for our lives. As you're looking at it and facing God as one who would comment on your life, hey, I want you to be meek, not weak, but meek. Next section is verse 7 through 11. And this is what it says. Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? This is the second standard that God really wants to look at our life, the inside, not the outside. He wants us to look at our lives that way. He wants us to look at other people's lives by that standard. If anyone is convinced, he says in, our, in himself, that he's Christ, let him consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. Uh, verse 8, he says, For even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification, that means building, another Spanish word, edificio, See, I'm learning. And not for your destruction, I shall, be, I shall not be ashamed, lest I seem to terrify you by my letters. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when we're absent, that's exactly what we'll be indeed when we're present. Now, Paul is saying here some Words that he's, he's saying it in a meek way, but he's saying it in a strong way, too. He's saying, you know, it's time to start judging things from the inside, not the outside. And Paul had an authority. He had an authoritative position that was God-given. He was an apostle, and that means one sent by God. And some people accepted that, some people didn't. But Paul knew it. It wasn't something that he put himself up to. He was stopped in the middle of Damascus Road and said hey, you're going to turn around and you're going to go my way. And that's exactly what happened in his life. But he had that power given by God to build people up, not to tear people down. You know, sometimes worldly authority is so that you can have people serve you. No, Paul's authority was so that he could go and serve others, so that he could take care of others. And it was for construction, not destruction. But the only thing that Paul did want to tear down, we just saw it, was strongholds, things that kept people from God, from a relationship with him. But what you see is as he was doing this, his critics, and he did have those destructive critics as we were talking about, they took the kind of classic school playground approach, which is making fun of Paul's appearance. I don't know if you remember that from the school days, and I won't tell you some of the nicknames I got along the way, but because then you would use them on me, and I'm glad to have those as part of my past. But basically what they were saying with Paul as you know, he has the perfect face for letter writing. <laughs> you know, he, it's good to get a letter from him, then you don't have to look at him. But in person, he is not very impressive. And you think about the power of words and the power of a put-down, which is just somebody saying, I'm going to make myself better by pushing you down, by making you look worse, and I can feel better about myself. And that is so much a part of the world that we live in. And so Paul here, he criticizes his critics, but in a different way. In truth, in love, he says, you know what? You need to start focusing on the inside, not the outside, because that's what God is all about. And on American Idol, I don't know if you ever watched some of these, but you know, people actually got pretty upset. Even some of the people who really liked Simon said, Simon, that's too much. You know, that's too far. He got really sarcastic a couple times and he made some very cruel comments and he almost got booted off the show at some point for being just too personal. And so he's toned it down just one little notch here and there, you know, but he was ridiculing people's appearance. That was his big thing is, you know, telling them their eyes look buggy and they look you know, crazy or whatever else, or your hair is just hideous. And he's supposed to be there to uh, comment on their singing talent, not their appearance. And so I thank God, and I hope you do too, that Simon is not going to be my judge on anything in life. But, but God's standard, what is it? It's inward, not outward. Very important. And 1 Samuel 16.7 is a great cross-reference for this. 1 Samuel 16.7, it says, The Lord does not see as man sees. Man sees and looks upon the outward appearance. But God looks beyond that and he sees the heart. And so the false teachers were apparently 
How are they picking leadership? Well, it was on the basis of personal charisma. It's kind of like they were saying, hey, we're Christians, we're in Christ. Isn't it obvious from our outside? I mean, isn't it obvious from our very presence? I mean, just spend a few moments with us and you'll get that aura around us and that sort of thing. And sometimes you have maybe come into contact with people who try to have that thing, or maybe they even do in some way that you're like, wow, there's something very unique about that person. They talk about it on the show like, oh, they have it, whatever it is, that person has it. And so as for Paul, his critics would have said, eh, he doesn't have it. We don't even know if he's saved for sure. That's what he's having to come back and say, look, guys, I'm in Christ too. I mean, think about the Apostle Paul having to go to that level to tell people, look, I'm a Christian, guys. I don't know if you know, uh, remember that. But they were saying, we don't even know if he's saved. He's certainly not God's main man. I mean, just look at him. I mean, he doesn't look like an apostle to me. I mean, what? An apostle ought to be tall and wonderful and all these things and have that star quality. And in that culture, if they had had a show that was called like Corinthian Idol or whatever else, it wouldn't have been based on singing. See, this is important for us to understand sometimes the history because we understand where Paul's coming from and we can apply it more to our life which is it wouldn't have been based on singing, it would have been based on two things, public speaking ability and appearance, those things. The Greeks were famous for those two things. Their good looks, you know, all of the Greek gods and Greek goddesses, the statues that survive to this day, that was the standard of beauty. And also you see oratory skill. That was what it was all about. Who had the silver tongue, who could speak, who could bring that argument, and sometimes, again, Aren't you glad that's part of our past and we never make decisions about people based on those things today? Hey, can they give a good speech? Do they look good in a suit or whatever else? But Paul, he didn't do so well on these criteria here. He really didn't. And there's a, a extra biblical writing that kind of talks about him, but it fits certainly the uh, scriptural descriptions as well. But it, it's basically that the critics had an easy shot at him. They could say, hey, look, man, he's short. I mean, he, he can't be an apostle. <laughs> he's too short to be an apostle. And look at him, man. He's kind of messed up. I mean, he's been on the prison diet for a long time. You know, he just got out of jail, it looks like. I mean, those are the only clothes he has. He's all scratched up. He looks like he got one beating too many. Just walked out of a shipwreck or something, you know. And they could say, hey, he, it looks like he got his egg scrambled or something. He just, you know, his, speak is, his speech is contemptible, you know, hard to even say that word, contemptible. In other words, maybe he said um a lot, you know, while he was trying to, uh, let's see, um, ouch, you know, he's still thinking about the last beating he took. Hmm. Mispronounced a word or two along the way, maybe lost his place in his notes or something, didn't use enough big fancy words for them didn't use the right gestures. That was a part. They had whole books in the Greek thing about when to pause and when to point and when to do all these things. And maybe Paul was too busy reading the scriptures to really get into all of that. And so he didn't impress them on that point. And so the critics said, listen, that was horrible. Remember these words, Paul. You're not an apostle. You know, that's the kind of thing that he would hear. And so Christianity, it's so important to see. It's not a popularity contest. That's, that's important for us to know. It's not a speech contest, you know. It's not a beauty contest. I can be thankful for that. But it's important to communicate clearly, if you can, as clearly as you can. But again, so, so often people put this pressure on themselves even to say, well, I can't be used of God because I don't have all of this polish in these ways. But I think about this, I always like to share some of the dumb things I do, and I have a very long list, so I'll never run out. But one of them is when I first started teaching, I, I, I was very, very nervous. To this day, I get very, very nervous. I'm just getting a little better at hiding it. But back then, I, there was the first teaching I did, I had a music stand out here. It wasn't a pulpit like this. It was a music stand, and it was adjustable. You know, it, it was the kind that goes up and down easily. Uh, these lock, but the kind I had just kind of up and down. So I didn't know I was doing it, but I was just doing this during the whole teaching. And the sad part, it was filmed. Um, you know, the, it, it happened to be on video. And later, we went back and looked at it, and it looked like I was pumping up a tire is what it looked like. I was like this. You know, we put it on fast motion and laughed at it and everything else. And I can be 
my own worst critic in that sort of thing. Sometimes a lot of us can be. But it's good to learn those things and maybe not be a distraction if you can help it in whatever you do. But the destructive criticism that was coming toward Paul, it really had nothing to do that. It, with that. It was somebody who would find fault no matter what. No matter what it was. Paul could have given the most incredible teaching ever and they'd say, um, by the way, you... Uh, you skipped a verse or whatever else or you went you know you mispronounced that thing and so often again our world is so harsh on people if you think about what it is to grow up and what it is to hear so many of these things and and just a reminder I think it's such a great thing to know the grace of God and to think of him as the person who matters what his opinion of you is and it's so different than what maybe people have said to you but some of the people in church history that we've had, you know, if you go back and look at their pictures or you uh, read these things, they, they weren't really polished people. They were kind of rough sometimes. You know, ordinary men and women who had, as the Bible said, been with Jesus. That's the real thing that he rubbed off on them. And Jesus himself, the Bible says, had no beauty that would attract us to him on the outside. But of course, an inward beauty that cannot be matched. And so we live in a world that is so ruthless on this, so ruthless with physical criticism. And, you know, people just can't wait to snap a picture of some celebrity cellulite, you know, so they put it on the front page, you know. I just, the other day, that was one of the headlines on the thing, you know, that somebody's got cellulite. Whoa! Like, that's breaking news. Come on. But if a person's critique of you or the voice you hear in your head has everything to do with the outward and it has nothing to do with the inward that God wants to really look at and have you look at, well, then you can just kind of reject that. You can just say, you know what, if, if, maybe my ears are too big, but that's okay. Maybe I can hear the Lord better, you know, or maybe I'm too short, but that, that's okay, you know. It's all right to be horizontally or vertically challenged or whatever. I'll be those things. That's all right. It's not God's evaluation of us, not based on the outside. It's based on the inside. And then there's the third and final section of this, and I love it. Verse 12 to the end. You seeing these things, the, the things that God would look at to evaluate a life, to look at a life and, and see whether he says, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I like. Or, no, that's, that's really not it for me. He talks about meekness, not weakness. He talks about focusing on the inside, not the outside. But also, the last one is, who's really getting the glory from your life? Who's your life being lived for? God's glory or your own? God's glory or man's approval? And so verse 12, let's read down through that, through the end. It says, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed to us, a sphere which especially includes you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though our authority didn't extend to you, for it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ. And verse 15 there through the end, it says, not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other man's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall actually be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere. In other words, as soon as you guys are real well established, we can actually go on to some other places with this great news. And he says, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment, but he who glories, let him glory in the Lord, for not, it's not the one who commends himself who's approved, but whom the Lord commends. Now what you see there as he ends up the chapter, again, it's who's getting the glory, who's getting the commendation, who is the one who your life is pointing to. And critics love to point to other people and compare everyone to everyone else, favorably or unfavorably. Either way, you know, you'll, you'll hear him say something like, oh, you know, this album's really good it reminds me of Bruce Springsteen's first album or whatever else oh it's really good like that or you know a, a sequel will come out and a critic will go oh the second one's terrible I mean uh, not anywhere near as good as the first one that sort of thing and and people just come along and maybe even compare kids and say well you're a lot better than the last one boy that first one we had was terrible but you're a lot better you know or, or why can't you be more like or less like and all that and even I could do better than that you know people always comparing 
each other with each other. And Paul criticized his critics for that. He said, don't, don't do that. For comparing yourself among yourself, that's not a wise way to compare. You're not going to get any good answers that way. Man's opinion, man's commendation, seeking man's glory or you know, looking for love in, in, in people and having their acceptance of you. People are very, very fickle. I think of this as kind of a funny story and I'll embarrass her because she's sitting right there. But um, our youth pastor, uh, his wife's name is, is Belkis. And uh, right before, uh, they, they had a wedding a little while back, and I'm kind of new to texting, and I don't know much about texts, you know, but I, I know this. I got a text from Belkis that said, I love you. <laughs> I said, I always thought she looked at me funny. I'm going to have to talk <laughs> with Jose about this. No, but about 15 minutes later, I got a thing that said, I'm sorry, I don't love you. <laughs> And it turns out that just in the chaos of the day, she had meant to be sending that to someone else. She ended up sending it to uh, my address by accident. But that's just a a very clear indication of how fickle people's acceptance of you can be. And if like one moment I'm like, yes, somebody loves me. And then 15 minutes, I'm sorry, I don't love you. It was all a mistake. But see, that's why in, in life so often people are, are oh, oh, somebody cares, nobody cares, all that sort of thing. You say, wait a minute. Paul here, he's talking about these things and he says, man's opinion, man's commendation, somebody does or doesn't like you, that's not worth a whole lot. See, this was a mutual admiration society there in in the false teachers. They were all just saying, you know what? You are so wonderful. You know, just false flattery of one another. You are great. No, 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 you are wonderful. No, 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 you are the best. No, not nearly as good as you. You know what? Let's all agree we're all wonderful. Okay, we'll just accept Paul. Paul stinks. Yeah, let's bash Paul. And Paul says, come on, man. What are you going to learn that way? Nobody ever reaches their potential by only hearing lovely lies about how wonderful they are. Never hearing a tough truth that says, man, this is something that needs to change in your life. And have you ever wondered how it can be on that show if you've ever watched it? Especially the early days, you know, when you watch it, in the early program. Some people only watch that in the series. Just those first ones where all the idiots are in there, you know, just the people who can't sing at all. And... Of course there are those who are just being a fool to be a fool, you know, just going on knowing they're terrible and they're just, they can get even famous for being terrible and famous is famous, right? So some people do that, but some genuinely think they're wonderful. They really think they are going to be the winner and they don't even make it through the first round. I mean, they just, you are bad and you, you heard people like that where he said, look, do you have a lawyer? Sue your vocal coach, you know, you are not a singer. And the guy's saying, I don't believe you. But anyone with an ear might tell him the exact same thing, except some people who love them too much, quote unquote, to tell them the truth. See, I think that's a lot of the problem sometimes is that they compare themselves with themselves. They're the best singer in their group of friends, but they all are terrible, you know, or something like that. None of them can sing, but that's the best of the, of the worst. And so many people out of love, again, will tell somebody a lovely little lie. Oh, you're so wonderful. But they sing in the key of H flat. And you say, well, is there a key of H flat? No, that's the whole thing. And so sometimes it's good to have an objective voice, an objective critic in our life to do some critical thinking and think things through and say, you know what? This is right. This is wrong. This is helpful. This is not. This is something you want. This is something you don't want. And somebody, hopefully, who will speak that truth in love. That's the, that's the important thing. And it isn't wise to use others as your standard. That's some of the constructive criticism Paul is giving us through the scripture here. Why? Because there's only one of two reactions and they're both bad. One is that you're going to get puffed up in pride. You're going to look and pick the worst examples. Look at them and say, hey, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as that guy over there or that person over there. I'm trying not to point at any specifics. That person over there, you know, somewhere else who doesn't even go here you know, or whatever. Or the other option is you're going to pick people who you look at and say, oh, I'll never be like they are. They're so wonderful and I'm so terrible. And I've got, you know, and you're going to just get dragged down. And those are the only two options when you're comparing yourselves among yourselves. And so Paul says, you know what? You need to pick the one critic in your life who really matters, God, which is what Paul did. He said, I'm going to let him be 
my judge. I'm going to let him be the one who gives me the feedback that I need. What he's given me, what he has put in front of me, his plan for me, his correction in my life, his direction in my life, that's what I want. And you think about it, Paul uses an interesting little phrase here. He talks about my sphere. He says, this is my sphere. Verse 13, verse 16. And just to get a picture of what that is, I just want to think about it for a moment here as we close out, which is, it's like God draws a circle around every person's life. You know, a, a 3D little drawing, a little sphere there of influence and says, okay, that's, that's going to be your life. That, some people have a humongous sphere. You know, somebody who you look on and go, wow, that one, that's as big as the world, as big as the universe. I mean, you think about this. Abraham. God said to Abraham, Abraham, every person on the planet in one way or another is going to be blessed through your life. Whoa, that's quite a sphere. Through all human history because of the faith that you had. Wow, that's, that's quite a sphere. And it's like God is saying to people, that's your sphere right there. That's who you're going to be in me. Oh, it's not just you. It's, it's you and me together. That's how God makes a sphere with something. That's who you are in Christ. No more, no less. And again, some people have a humongous sphere. Of influence. Others have maybe a smaller one, one that's not quite so impressive from the outside. And again, a guy like Abraham, well, if I was to compare myself to Abraham, I might say, man, my sphere stinks. I got no, I can't, I, all the world blessed through me, that's probably not going to happen. You know, or Moses, Moses, wow, what a sphere. So many miracles, man, the Red Sea thing and all that. I never, I can't even, you know, get the shower to work and stuff like that. And then you see Paul, you know, he, he wrote a big portion of the New Testament. And some of us say, man, I haven't even read all his letters and look how many he wrote. And God says, you know what, I'm not going to ask you, how were you, you know, why weren't you like Abraham? Or why weren't you Moses? Or why didn't you be as prolific as Paul? But God will maybe say to a lot of us, hey, why weren't you you in me? <laughs> why weren't you in the sphere that I had for you. Why wasn't that what you were content with? Sometimes you'll look and criticize others or whatever else, and he says, man, I got a sphere for you. And there's only one way to get in God's sphere for your life. It's to commit your life to Christ and not just, you know, a one-time thing and say, well, there, did that, on to the next, you know, but committing your life to following him and making him the one whose approval you seek, whose desire you have, to let him be your biggest critic in life? Why? Because he's not going to criticize you. That's really not what he's going to do. He's actually your biggest fan. He's the one who wants to see you succeed. He wants to see you do well. And anything he tells you, even the hard things along the way, through his word, by his spirit, they're going to be for our benefit. He wants to help. And you and I, the only way any of us will find peace or joy, fulfillment, a meaning in life, is going to be in our sphere, not by looking at somebody else's sphere of influence and saying, why aren't I there? But to say, as God looks at it and says, no, why aren't you there? Why aren't you where I have you? But in order to do that, you need to give your life and live your life for God's glory and not your own. See, that's what Paul did. Not to please people, because people are impossible to please, but God is possible to please. And at the end of your life, it'd be such a wonderful thing as you Stand in front of, not Simon, but the Savior, to hear, hey, well done. That was fantastic. I don't think Jesus has a, a uh, British accent or any other uh, type. I don't know what he sounds like. But I know it's going to sound good to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You are on to heaven. Not on to Hollywood, uh, you know, on to heaven. And it's such a wonderful thing to, to know that and to have that confidence. Now, Paul says you can boast in what? God's grace. See, this is where we close out and we give this challenge and we give this opportunity every week. And it's something that if you've never done it, you need to do it. You need to know it and you need to settle it. The issue of life, which is what's your sphere, the only way you're ever going to know that, the only way you're ever going to know what your life is about and what it's supposed to be lived for is when you live it for Christ. And see, 
There's constructive criticism in the Bible. You're going to find a lot of loveless truth out there in the world. You can find loveless truth. There's things that are true, but there's no love, no hope, no future mixed in with those things. And you can also find truthless love. Oh, there's lots of that in our society. Everything is beautiful. Everything's okay. Everything is wonderful. But see, God is a constructive critic, and there's only one place you're going to find the biblical balance. That's in the Bible, which is the truth in love. And that is at the cross. See, that's what the, all the critics were finding fault with in the end. That's why they found fault with Paul, because the cross, it has a criticism of our life, which is what? You ain't good enough. <laughs> you ain't good enough for God. You can't work your way to God. If you could... If you could just on your own performance be okay with God, then why would he send his son to die for our sin to pay the price for what we couldn't pay for? So there's a criticism of our life, but it's a constructive criticism that God says, you know, yeah, it's true, you're not good enough. Your performance wasn't enough, but here, I have a little deal for you. What if, what if my perfect performance is what I will credit you for. And I will look at your life and I'll say, you know, I'll perform perfectly and I'll judge you on that basis, not on the basis of your own performance. You say, phew, that'd be awesome. You know, get somebody else to sing for me. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Well, that's exactly what he did. Because again, and we may not be able to sing, all of us, but we've all been able to sin. Just leave the G off it. We're not all singers. We're all sinners. And that's what the cross says so loud and clear. But it also says something else, which is we're not good enough for God, but God is good enough to care for us. So what we're going to do, how do we do it? We're just going to close out in a prayer. It's the weapons of our warfare, mighty for taking down strongholds. And maybe there's a stronghold in your life that you said, I've always been critical of Christianity. Or, and Christians have been critical of me, or I've found fault with this and that. Look, there's no way to find fault with Christ and with the offer of grace that he has. So what we do is just at the end of this prayer, I'm going to give an opportunity for you to raise your hand, to acknowledge your need. I need a Savior. I want to give my life to him. I want to follow after him. I know he's my biggest fan. I want to start living for him. So that's what we're going to do. By raising your hand, you're acknowledging your need. Let's go ahead and pray together. Father, I ask that you would at this time touch the heart of anyone who needs that issue settled, the issues of life, the, the issue of life, the critical question, not what does anyone else think of me, what does my parents, what do they think of me, or what does the person sitting next to me think, or any of that. What do the people I work with think? None of that matters, Lord. That's not the people that we will be standing before one day. One day we'll stand before you, and the only question will be, what did you do with Jesus? And so, Lord, I pray if there's anyone here, the weapons of our warfare, they're mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. And if there's people here who have not ever had the humility and faith to come to you just in a simple way and say, I open my heart, I invite you inside to be my Lord and Savior, I pray that they'd have the courage and the wisdom to do that now. In Jesus' name. Now, with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, I'm just going to give a Quick opportunity here. If you're here in the room and you're sitting in your seat and you say, man, I need, I need what you talked about. I need to know that I'm headed to heaven and the only way to know that is Jesus. If that's your need here tonight, I'm just going to ask you right where you're sitting to raise up your hand and acknowledge your need. Anybody here tonight? I see you there in the back. God bless you. Anybody else? Just want to accept the Lord here tonight. Anybody here? I'll give just a brief moment more. For you, raise your hand. I'm just going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. It's a prayer of commitment to Christ. It's a prayer of opening your heart and life to Him. God, I open my heart and I invite you inside to be my Savior, to be my friend, to be my greatest advocate, the one who would be on my side pulling for me. And Lord, I pray that you would forgive me of my sin and that you would wash me clean. I want to follow you from this day forward. And I want to be listening to your voice and your evaluation of my life. And thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.